welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to this week's Griscom stream. David here. Hope you're doing well wherever you are. I'm really excited. We have uh, two wonderful guests on this uh, week to talk about uh, what's going on in Chicago. Um, you know, some really interesting election results and an exciting um, result in the fact that Brandon Johnson got elected. We're going to have them on to talk a little bit about what worked um, and also some of the things that that campaign and movement will be facing um, in the next few years. Um, just a quick programming note. Um, as you all know, these streams tend to be a little bit more interactive. If you have any questions um, for the first bit, um, I'll put them up if they're about Chicago. Um, but if you have something you want to talk about um, that's not about this, you know, I'll hang out after the interview and I'll answer whatever's on y'all's mind. Um, but without uh, further ado, let's bring on our guest for this afternoon. Uh, first up, we have Miles Camp Lassen, um, who is a reporter and web editor of In These Times. Thank you so much for joining us, Miles. Very happy to be here, Dave. Thanks for having me. Of course. And uh, Alex Hahn. Alex Hahn is a labor organizer and the executive director of In These Times magazine. Uh, how's it going, Alex? Uh, it's going well. Thanks for having me, David. Well, um, I I want to like really get into what happened with this election. Um, but if Alex, if you want to start us off by just letting our listeners know who Brandon Johnson is, uh, because a lot has been said about him in Chicago's, you know, Chicago's an interesting city because it's obviously such an important and, and large city in the U S but I find, um, you know, sometimes people really aren't getting a lot of quality information about what's happening in that city outside of Chicago. So could you give folks a sense of who uh, Brandon Johnson is just briefly up top? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do it quickly. I mean, Brandon Johnson is a lot of things. He is a resident of the west side of Chicago, the first mayor um, from the west side, primarily black west side um, in over 100 years. Um, he's a former middle school teacher uh, teaching at a few different schools um, on the near north side of Chicago, where the Cabrini Green uh, public housing projects used to be, and then at Westinghouse um, on the west side. Uh, he's a former Chicago Teachers Union organizer and staffer. Um, when Karen Lewis and a rank and file caucus took over the Chicago Teachers Union in 2010, um, he was a part of the first class of kind of summer organizing trainees. Mm -hmm. um, they were really training people up from the rank and file, not just for staff jobs, but to learn organizing skills. Um, that we're going to help them campaign in the future, um, you know, and he is somebody who has been, you know, an organizer and activist on the front lines, you know, for the last decade plus. Um, and as of Monday, right around noon central time, um, he uh, is now the mayor of the city of Chicago. And, and y'all were both at the inauguration, if I'm correct, right? Um, yeah. What was the energy like there, uh, Miles? Well, I got to say, it was pretty incredible to see, you know, the kind of the fruits of this multi-year, multi-racial, intergenerational, working class led movement, really getting to celebrate itself, taking the reins of power in the third largest city in the country. Um, that by itself, you know, made for a pretty incredible moment. Um, but also, this was a campaign that was largely about joy, you know, mm -hmm. and really celebrating people and the city of Chicago. And, you know, the, when you listen to the speech Brandon Johnson gave, it was all about the soul of Chicago. He invoked, you know, so many figures throughout the um, history of the city from um, DuSable to Ida B. Wells, um, you know, the, and Karen Lewis, of course, a great working class champion herself, who was Brandon Johnson's mentor. In many ways, it kind of felt like a church church service, you know, and, and, and I think that fit in with a lot of the rhetoric Johnson had on the campaign trail about this being the revival and the resurrection of Chicago. You could really feel that within um, the uh, the space that was held, there was a gospel singers, there were choirs, there was a lot of call and response happening from the audience, um, and just smiles everywhere you you looked. And that, you know, having lived in the city for a very long time, having covered uh, city politics for um, for over a decade under Rahm Emanuel, under Lori Lightfoot, these previous uh, neoliberal mayors who were hell bent on maintaining a status quo that kind of shut working people out of the halls of power and out of decision making. To see people being welcomed in and um, and celebrating uh, uh, somebody coming into the city hall on the fifth floor was really uh, a, quite a, 
market difference from what we've seen before and a real relief. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's early days, but mm -hmm. I gotta say it's, it, it does feel like a new day in terms of city politics here. Well, um, I, I'd be curious to, to hear y'all's thoughts on this because, you know, Brandon Johnson didn't just like fall from the moon, right? Like this is a years long kind of project of building up a real strong working class political movement in Chicago. Um, you know, Chicago is obviously very famous for having a very strong political machine. I mean, could you all give people who might not be as familiar with Chicago a sense of just like this upsurge in organizing and working class politics that we've seen in the past decade plus in the city? Yeah, I'm, you know, I, th I think none of this would have happened without the caucus of rank and file educators, um, mm -hmm. a group inside the Chicago Teachers Union forming in 2008 and deciding to contest for power in an internal union election in 2010. There's a parallel there with Mayor Johnson's campaign um, this past election cycle, which is that a lot of people inside and outside the labor movement, a lot of people on the left, um, thought it was premature for them to try mm -hmm. to contest for power inside the teachers union just a year and a half um, after their formation. Um, I think fortunately for all of us, um, you know, those people were proven wrong um, and, and, uh, and that there is, you know, the, there is something about, you know, for the left, uh, being right is clearly um, inadequate and it is clearly only a small part um, of, of what we need for success. And I do think there's something really to be learned, not just from uh, Brandon Johnson, not just from this movement, um, this election. Um, I think of, you know, I go back to the, the fall and winter of 2008, when a group of workers at a window and door factory um, in Chicago, in response to their employer uh, announcing that he was going to be moving their jobs to a non-union factory, occupied their plant. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't wait strategically to say what is the right exact moment. Um, they reacted and responded, um, and they were able to win enormous concessions from that employer and continue to operate a cooperatively owned window factory um, on the southwest side of Chicago now. You know, that was something that I think was really intimately connected to some of the beginnings of this, um, this rank and file militant movement in the Chicago Teachers Union. I think it exists in a lot of other places um, in different ways inside the labor movement. Um, in Chicago. And I think that kind of opportunism and uh, ability to respond um, is a muscle that's been developed in Chicago really uh, effectively over the last 15 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really like what, what you say, too, is like the left sometimes is very fixated on not only being right, but it's like this idea, too, that like if you have the right arguments, for example, like a political campaign, like the right messaging or framing you're going to win um and like that's not always the case right like you can have the best white papers and policy platform out there and you're not gonna be able to win if people don't trust you and i think that that was one thing that was really unique um, or exciting about the brandon johnson campaign from what i saw from afar but um i mean i, I want to talk a little bit about some of the coalitions and movements um <laughs> that, that have come up around this um you know you don't want to talk too much about the the dark times but this was a really stark election right um, you know, and if you could give folks, uh, Miles, uh, if you'd like to, like a, a sense of who Paul Vallis was and like what he represented, because in a lot of ways, like he really is a kind of stand in for like a neoliberal or pro privatization, typical, I don't know, machine candidate, right? Sure. Well, he wasn't just a stand in. He was actual architect of a lot of the those policies. And if you and he left a large footprint, you know, it's across the country. Chicagoans remember Paul Vallis from the mid 90s when he was first the budget director under uh, Richard M. Daly, um, a real strong handed mayor who started a lot of the um, efforts we see continued today to put power in the hands of corporate entities and to, you know, demolish public housing and to mm -hmm. defund public schools. Vallis served as his right-hand man in many ways on the budget, right? And that was uh, building austerity budgets that nickeled and dimed residents that, you know, uh, raised these really regressive fines and fees while still providing huge tax subsidies to uh, corporations. And this didn't just happen in Chicago. This is a trend we see, of course, in cities across the country. But um, after doing that, Vallis got rewarded by becoming head of the school system, where he uh, started to privatize services. He laid the groundwork for the mass school closings. We started to see under um, 
uh, daily later on. And then later, of course, under Rob Emanuel, when he closed 50 public schools 10 years ago, um, that was all part of the Vallis agenda. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, p- administrators across the country bought into this idea of like corporate education reform as some kind of salvation for the issues plaguing public schools. And that included the Democratic Party, right? For a long time, we saw people like Michelle Rhee and Eva Moskowitz and, you know, this whole waiting for Superman kind of mentality mm-hmm. really take over the um, establishment of the Democratic Party who became pro-charter school. And so because of that, Ballas was able to um, get jobs in Philadelphia, where he decimated the school system. In New Orleans, he got brought in after Hurricane Katrina to basically wipe out the entire public school system and replace it with um, private interests. And a similar thing happened in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he got like immediately fired for all kinds of ridiculous reasons that he, he basically was not qualified to even run it. I don't think he's qualified to run any you know, public school system, <laughs> let alone a city. Um, and, and so we tried to, you know, people that were involved in uh, covering this race tried to really make clear that Paul Bellis had a long record because he ran a campaign as somebody who kind of knew how to get the job done, mm-hmm. which is kind of similar to Rahm Emanuel. Like, I'm a businessman. I know how to, you know, take care of budgets and things like that. But the way he took care of budgets was by putting them on the backs of working people. And he had a long track record of doing that versus Brandon Johnson, who, as Alex said, he comes out of the labor movement. You know, this is somebody who spent their career organizing people for social and economic justice. And I'll just say, you know, you mentioned coalition building. And I do think that it's true that, you know, the teachers union played an instrumental role in this campaign and helped to kind of recruit Brandon Johnson into this this um, role that eventually led him to become mayor. But it was a whole constellation of movements that were part of this. And that includes racial justice movements that have been fighting for years against, you know, police violence and, um, racist forms of, you know, economic plans that have been pushed down on the city. It includes the, you know, fight for 15 and, you know, the workers uh, organizing for for higher wages. Um, It includes, you know, environmental uh, justice advocates that played a key role in Brandon Johnson's campaign as well. So it really was kind of a whole host of organizations. And I'll just say to link it to, you know, the most recent mayor, When Lori Lightfoot became mayor in 2019, it was largely because she was running uh, a campaign that seemed to promise many of the demands that these same movement organizations were calling for. But Mm -hmm. she kind of hoodwinked them. She just said that she was going to, you know, do those things. And that helped to win her, you know, some support among people that wanted a progressive vision to be implemented in the city. But as soon as she got into office, she reneged on them and kind of went back to her corporate lawyering ways and um, and sort of just served the same type of interests that have dominated um, the city for, for a very long time. So that's the real promise, I think, of mm-hmm. what uh, this new administration offers is somebody who is not just giving lip service to um, social movements, but who actually comes out of them and is a participant, you know, in a lot of the efforts from hunger strikes against school closings to, you know, fighting to um, maintain to, to, to get a progressive income tax in, this, uh, in the state of Illinois. All these fights Brandon Johnson has been leading. So it is far more likely that he'll continue in that direction than somebody like a uh, Lori Lightfoot. Yeah, no, I mean, like, you know, one, one of the big things that we try to cover on this this program is this idea there's like a big difference between being class focused and being class rooted, right? Like, the you know, you can talk about the working class, you can talk about working class people and talk about policies that you think that will help them or that they like. But there's something that is very important about actually coming from those communities. Um, one, hopefully, so that you when you get into office, you don't sort of turn your back on folks. But two, so when you say you want to do things for people, they trust you and believe you. Um could y'all talk a little bit about the United Working Families uh, group? And because, you know, I, th- I think that that's a really interesting uh, movement in Chicago as well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. And Miles, you should feel free to interrupt or add. Um, you know, United Working Families was a political organization formed in 2014 um, by the Chicago Teachers Union, SEIU Healthcare Illinois in Indiana, uh, a community organization called Action Now. Um, that has its membership base on the south and west sides of Chicago and historically black communities um, and grassroots Illinois action. 
which was kind of a political arm of a, of a coalition of community groups around the city um, that work on you know, houselessness, um, that work on issues around hunger, that work on issues of environmental justice, a whole host of different things. Um, and it was really formed in a lot of ways because, um, because of the challenges of the immediate years before that, right? The school mm -hmm. closings and the lack of a political price that elected leaders had to pay. Um, attempts to run movement leaders and activists for office, but getting stonewalled. Um, and in really thinking forward um, to being able to, to contest for power in a meaningful way. Um, and so in a lot of ways, it was an independent political organization, um, a party building apparatus, you know, for, for a situation where it was hard to just define yourselves, you know, as a third party. Um, but it's become really successful. Several dozen, um, you know, elected officials now have been elected from UWF at all levels from from kind of local government um, through the state legislature into the halls of Congress. Um, and so it's been, I think, really the most successful example of a labor community coalition, um, the most successful example um, of a political party-like structure being built mm. um, around the country um, that can really advance in a collective way. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think that um that point is really fundamental to the role that UWF plays in Chicago politics because we're a city that's dominated by the Democratic Party. So people mm -hmm. are running, you know, seemingly all as Democrats. And that doesn't create many opportunities for clarifying politics and offering alternatives to what is, you know, being offered. I mean, Paul Ballas ran as a Democrat. But meanwhile, he was, you know, speaking at these fundraisers for far right groups that were pushing transphobic policies. We know he was running on like a regressive economic agenda. And then that all can fall under this big tent of the Democratic Party. The UWF offers an opportunity, um, even though it's not like a separate ballot line, the same way like Working Families Party operates in New York and other mm -hmm. places. It does allow for candidates to define themselves and, and affiliate themselves with a different type of politics that's more, as you say, rooted in um, in the working class and in fighting for a different vision of how we arrange society where people have more democratic control over the decisions that affect their lives, everything from, you know, the economy to education, to housing, to healthcare, and so on. And I think that uh, United Working Families has done a good job so far of showing how you can translate that into effective electoral campaigns, right? I mean, that's the uh, benefit that when candidates, you know, run through UWF, they, the organization knocked on, you know, half a million doors for Brandon Johnson over the course of this campaign through a massive ground game that can help to swing elections and close races, you know? And I think that that's the role a lot of these more insurgent left electoral groups are playing, groups like Justice Democrats and even Democratic Socialists of America, you know, DSA has its own sense of ground game and often mm -hmm. um, works together with groups like United Working Families on um, electoral campaigns. And so it just goes to show that's what kind of like left coalition building can offer and once that proves itself capable and successful, then that becomes the source, the pole of power, right? Where people are trying to catch up to it. And I think that that's where we're, we're starting to see that become manifest in Chicago after these past like 10 or so years of UWF operating on the ground. So um, if, if y'all could just sort of, because uh, I, I want to sort of talk a little bit more about what's coming up next, um, but I think there's like a lot of lessons in, in this campaign that are, are worthwhile, because like a lot of our listeners are spread across the country. A lot of them are in, organized in different kinds of groups. So like learning what was successful here, I think is really helpful. But if y'all could give people who might not have followed this race closely, like a sense, obviously, like privatization was an issue, um, how we want to deal with policing was an issue. But like, what were the major issues and and the kind of money that was being thrown into this campaign? And and how were things framed and, and organized, right? Like the, the kinds of groups, that, like when people were going out and messaging for Brandon Johnson, they were saying, vote for Brandon Johnson for for what? Um, I'll just, uh, I think that crime was a, was a really central issue in this campaign, largely because the media decided that that was yeah. the central issue of the campaign, you know, and you would see polling that would say like public safety or is is number one issue. And then that would just get determined to be crime. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's an important um, 
a point to focus on because as a referendum on what kind of an approach to crime and public safety and criminal justice voters want in Chicago, that choice was very clear. Mm. Uh, You had Paul Vallis running an extreme law and order campaign backed by the extreme fraternal order of police, the police union who promised blood on the streets and mass resignation of cops if Vallis didn't win. Um, and who, you know, their leader, John Canton, is there as like a diehard Trump supporter and January 6th defender and everything. And, you know, Vallis seemingly like welcomed that type of endorsement and was promising more police. And that his answer to basically every social ill was more police. And then you had Brandon Johnson, who was running on a very different approach, which was focused on attacking root causes of, of crime and violent behavior through both uh, different types of supports, whether that's mental health support or providing alternatives to um, traditional policing, because so many, you know, mental uh, the 9-11 calls are actually people facing emergencies that don't have to do with a, a crime being committed necessarily, mm-hmm. but um, people that are in extreme situations, domestic abuse, all kinds of things. And, you know, when you just have police as the only line of defense, we've seen what happens. You know, we've upped the police budget in Chicago year after year, and yet that's not a solution to to crime. And so Brandon Johnson was running on things like a platform called Treatment Not Trauma, which offers um, an alternative to uh, just 911 as a as a place to turn and uh, social investments to provide the types of opportunities, whether that's employment or, you know, community programming, things that would that are proven to help reduce crime. Um, but it, you know, it, it costs money to do those things. He was slammed as like a defund candidate and, mm-hmm. you know, wanting to let chaos reign in the streets. Uh, constantly by the media, he was outspent two to one by Paul Vallis because wow. all the you know corporate central uh, uh, CEOs in the city and across the country decided to throw their money in with Paul Vallis, and it didn't work. And Brandon Johnson still won. And so I do think that that um, it's important to focus on crime. But you're right; there was a whole host of issues. I mean, when I think when people were going out on doors for Brandon, they were talking about. Um, his plan to honestly to tax the rich. I think that that was an effective thing because people on the city are so used to their property taxes going up. Mm -hmm. Brandon Johnson ran on a pledge not to raise property taxes, which in many ways are regressive because they hit, you know, single families versus things like a real estate transfer tax, which would um, go after, you know, large corporations that are, you know, buying up parcels of property as investment strategies. Um, He ran on a corporate head tax to actually you know, put have uh, wealthy corporations pay their fair share. Talking about those kinds of things um, that would provide actual relief for um, everyday Chicagoans while still providing revenue to, to fund some of these more ambitious proposals. I think that was uh, an effective strategy. And so it was, a, it was, a whole, it wasn't, it wasn't just crime. It wasn't just education. Mm-hmm. It was a whole series of issues. Um, but I think that by, not running away from progressive stances and instead kind of doubling down on them in the especially in the runoff election Mm -hmm. it it worked and i think that other campaigns across the country can take some lessons from that so anything you want to add to that alex or yeah i mean i i I think miles is totally right and you know i would i would also add that i think having that kind of not just having a big and broad campaign apparatus like the uwf field operation Um, you know, the enormous amount of volunteers, um, but having a lot of people who got activated and engaged who had been involved in these disparate, seemingly disparate struggles over the years and able to talk about their vote um, and talk about the election in the context of whatever their community was most concerned and interested in. I do think, you know, crime and safety were some of the biggest driving issues, but that's a much more complex issue than, you know, than the evening news. Um, allows us to to engage with, um, but talking to neighbors on the doors, talking to people on the phone, um, that allows for a slightly more nuanced conversation that brings out a set of consensus. Whether you believe there should be more police or less police, I don't think anyone believes that either one of those is the solution mm-hmm. to public safety. And so we can figure out where do we agree. Um, and I think that at the end of it, too, you know, left candidates are so often painted as you have unrealistic 
views, we have to point out that the other side, if they're going to say we're going to hire 1,800 cops, you have to say, what the hell are you talking about? Where are you going to hire these people from? How are you actually going to do that? It's actually the right wing that has unrealistic solutions. What we're trying to do is things that we've seen actually work. And I think that we can't be, you know, we can't hide that. Um, and we've got to say those things forcefully. I totally agree. I mean, um, I'd be curious because um, like the, the police unions and like the, the, the forces that are back in the police, I, I think have gotten really, I mean, you know, they've always been fairly reactionary, but really aggressive, like against democracy, like here in Austin, um, you know, there's this big police oversight bill that had been organized around for a long time. People collected signatures for it. And at the last minute, the cops went around and they got signatures for a fake proposal, right? Basically, they come up to you and say, do you want to do police oversight? And people say, yeah, we'll sign this petition. And literally, we had them on tape saying that they were from like social justice groups, like straight up line. Um, and they overstepped because once people realized that the cops were literally just like, you know, turning their nose at democracy, basically trying to run a fraudulent campaign. Um, you know, they lost something like 80 to 20 um, in the most recent election here. Um, I'd be curious just because obviously there is such a national narrative around Chicago. It's, you know, I think Republicans just pick that out of a hat as the place they're going to focus on. You never hear them talk about Tulsa or other places in the country that have a lot of violence. Um, but I'm curious um, to hear from both of y'all as, as residents of Chicago, as people who follow these things and write on these things. Um, one, like, if you could give people a sense of, like, how the police unions and the pro-police forces are sort of reacting to the the, the, the results of this election, um, and maybe some of the, um, whether or not you think that they might, like, because the, the idea around, the reason, like, a lot of Democrats, neoliberal Democrats endorse the police is they've, historically, that's been pretty safe, right, in the sense for them, like, it helps them win elections, because they can say whatever radical person wants to get rid of the cops or or whatnot. Um, but do you think there's starting to be a little bit of a turning point with like everyday communities in Chicago saying like, well, this doesn't mean as much to me, not, not that I don't care about crime or safety or anything like that, but just because like the police union is sort of pushing a certain narrative um, doesn't mean I'm nece necessarily going to go along with it. Yeah, I, I do think it's become more clear over the last few years, certainly in Chicago, um, that, you know, those, uh, and part of that is that, again, the simplified narrative is not something that really communicates and makes sense, you know, um, on a day-to-day -day level. We can't see, you know, the, the, the um, and the police union, you know, and I think there are things about, you know, Miles mentioned uh, president of the Chicago FOP um, being kind of an unrepentant Trump supporter mm -hmm. and unrepentant defender of January 6th. Um, those are things that articulate something very clear, I think, to the average Chicago voter. Um, you know, we've been seeing, you know, Chicago, not just on Trump's lips, on Ron DeSantis and others, um, you know, nationally, um, you know, and, and I think that that focus is actually, to me, going forward, um, frankly, could be helpful um, as we try to make some of those advances um, as this new administration and as a, a city council that has an almost a majority of progressive members, you know, mm -hmm. really tries to um, make some big changes. Um, I think that flipping that um, in the national narrative is going to be critically important. You know, Chicago has been, has played an outsized role. Chicago is, you know, the home, we, we are just a few weeks past May Day, and, and Chicago is the home of the eight-hour day. Chicago is the home of, of mm -hmm. so much of the modern labor movement um, that I do think if we can change these things in Chicago, um, then it's something that can reverberate much more broadly. Yeah. Well, um, in, in the last couple of minutes, um, obviously, like, it's great news, Brand Johnson's in power, but like, you know, it's one of those things that's like winning is like the first step um, in, in, in changing things, obviously. And, you know, it's going to be um, a struggle because like, even with the way that maybe the um, um, city government is, <clears throat> structure is, is fa favorable to, to change, but there's a lot of powerful interests that, you know. We don't get to vote for. Um, so if y'all could give us a sense of, you know, what things are coming up next. And like, if, I, if I'm correct, um, there's been some reshuffling and a lot of these more progressive members are, have been sort of elevated into positions of influence and, and power. So if y'all could talk a little bit about that and sort of, you know, what y'all see the next, you know, few months to the next year looking like in Chicago politics and the kind of outlook of what we should be expecting and hopeful for maybe. 
Yeah, well, like Alex said, the uh, there has been an elevation of the Progressive Caucus within the uh, City Council. And could, sorry, could you more... like just for people who aren't familiar with like the the you know we don't need like a long long lecture, but like how how that system works there because it's a little different from from others. Totally. So the City Council in Chicago is uh, fifty members, one from each ward. It's pretty massive for mm-hmm. you know any urban center but that's just how it's been for a long time so um wherever you you live your district you call it a ward here in chicago you elect your representative your your city council person and so there's 50 all across the city they each elect their own who is both kind of the community service representative right they're the person that you call to like fix potholes or get Mm -hmm. rats out of the alley or what have you um, it's also who you turn to if you need like zoning permissions change, that kind of thing, if you want to build a new kind of structure. And it's the legislative body that, uh, you know, puts forward different types of uh, proposals that then hopefully become um law within the city and in order to do that you need to have a majority so 26 members um the mayor actually operates which is very different from other cities the mayor operates as the leader of the city council effectively so kind of how kamala harris is in the senate as like a tiebreaker if there was a 2025 tie 25 25 tie here brandon johnson could break that you know in favor or not in favor so that's kind of like the numbers game of how of how it Mm -hmm. operates um because of that, pretty much every major proposal has to go through city council. Historically, um, the city council has operated effectively effectively as a rubber stamp. So it's existed in order to just serve the mayor's office and been pretty um, non-independent. Um, and that's because a lot of the people that have occupied these city council offices have worked as... Uh, treating it like a jobs program as a way to kind of do patronage in the community, for lack of a better word, and like hand out certain benefits to power to real estate developers, to, you know, powerful, wealthy interests. And they're, then they're rewarded with nice committee assignments. And then they just sign off on whatever the mayor asks them to do. That certainly was the case under the two daily administrations um, and under Rahm Emanuel, under Lori Lightfoot, you saw things start to change a little bit because she came into office in 2019 with a, mu- with a much more aggressive pose towards city council, trying to like, you know, shame them. And that created a lot of gridlock that's existed for the past four years. What the uh, reshuffled plan is that you mentioned, uh, Dave, is that there has been uh, a lot of allies of Mayor Johnson who are some of the most progressive uh members of city council, including all five, actually now six uh, DSA endorsed candidates um, are uh, going to have important roles. A number of them are going to be running committees. Um, Carlos Ramirez Rosa, the alderman of the 35th ward is a longtime DSA member um, and the head of the democratic socialist caucus. He's not only the head of the powerful zoning committee, one of the most powerful committees um, in city council, but also the floor leader for um, uh, Mayor Johnson. So that's, it's not exactly like a house speaker, but kind of like the most important role in mm-hmm. terms of the relationship to the mayor's office. So he's going to play an important role in terms of carrying out the agenda. And in terms of the next few months, I mean, to get back to your previous question and on the police union, you know, the, the, the head of the FOP promised a thousand officers were going to quit the day after Johnson took office. We're a few days out. I haven't seen those slips <laughs> come in. So I don't think, I think those fears were a little bit overblown. Um, I do think there's probably going to be, you know, tension there and that'll have to be soothed over. But I think there is a real rift between the head of the police union and the actual rank and file. And that does provide opportunity to Mm kind of, you know, um, highlight those divisions a little bit for the benefit of uh, the working class of the city. In terms of the agenda, what he's, he's laid out has been, you know, youth employment, which is a real proven track, has a proven track record of helping to reduce violence. Um, and crime in the city and to increase public safety and of course to provide a better pathway towards further employment for youth especially those from neighborhoods that have faced disinvestment Um, also a proposal called bring chicago home to raise taxes on 
wealthy real estate uh, luxury developments in order to um, provide housing for houseless uh, residents in Chicago. You know, there's tens of thousands of people sleeping on the streets. Now there's a migrant crisis as well, because Abbott has been blessing up these migrants, as you know, from, mm-hmm. uh, from the border to Chicago. That's created a crisis. So I think that's going to be top of the agenda as well. And then um, treatment, not trauma, as I mentioned, providing some other alternatives to um, policing that includes reopening mental health centers that were closed under Rahm Emanuel. I think we're going to see some initial movement on those things. There isn't a clear majority on city council yet if that's mm-hmm. like really progressive. So we're going to have to see some, um, I think, working behind the scenes to bring on um, people. But I think the, these are the issues that are popular in Chicago. Yeah. You know, these are voters want them. So like, it's going to be a hard to make the case that like, oh, I'm going to throw a wrench in the gears of this thing when like we just elected this mayor we've elected a historically progressive city council um a lot of people have made comparisons to harold washington you know who was the last real progressive mayor chicago had back in the 80s but the difference is he had a city council that was largely opposed to him that was full of conservative Mm. members this is a, a completely different this is a watershed in terms of progressive power in chicago so it's a real opportunity to flex some of that muscle and put uh, policy in place that's really going to back up some of the promises that are often made by people running left campaigns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would I would just add to that on the kind of immediate priorities question. Um, you know, I, I think you know Miles laid out a set of those policy priorities that Mayor Johnson campaigned on. You know, we are uh, a little over a week from Memorial Day weekend, um, which in the city of Chicago, as in a lot of places around the country. Um, is kind of a historical beginning of summer in all ways, good and bad. Um, And so, you know, I do think from my perspective, um, and I think I've been hearing a lot of people, you know, around the Johnson administration talk about a real focus this summer. I think it's a place where the, the, the housing crisis, the migrant crisis, and the question of public safety all intersect um, through the summer. Um, and th- it's, a, it's a time when a lot of those crises are most visible. Um, it's also the couple months that lead into Mayor Johnson's first city budget, um, which traditionally is introduced in September um, to be voted on by November. Um, and so I think these next three months, um, there's going to be a really critical focus and an all hands on deck focus on how are we driving interventions, non-police interventions um, mm-hmm. in public safety? How are we providing those youth jobs um, you know, how are the programs, you know, last summer, uh, Chicago is one of many cities around the country where we had so many of our pools and beaches closed because of a shortage of lifeguards. So how are we going to, you know, how is this administration um, going to handle that question of making sure that our public accommodations are actual public accommodations? And I think that's something that people are very focused on. Um, and I think it's going to, you know, those are the questions. And I, I think also a bigger question for the left. What do we want to focus on um, Mm -hmm. that is going to provide and help create the space for the bigger, longer term solutions? Mm -hmm. Um, And so if in the short term voters say, we feel like there's progress being made, we feel like there's progress being made on our safety in our neighborhoods, we feel like there's progress being made on the the crisis of the unhoused that is really very, very visible to people. Mm -hmm. Um, In a lot of places, we feel like there's progress being made on this manufactured crisis um, of migrants being used as political tools. Then I think that opens up a whole world of possibilities as we go into that budget season um, and talk about taxing the rich to pay for the real services that, that we need going forward. I think it's very well said. Um, well, uh, before y'all go, I mean, uh, you know, we, we, we have to talk about In These Times, an incredible publication, and our listeners should definitely be subscribing if they aren't already. But if y'all could just make a quick pitch on In These Times, why people should be checking out what to look forward to. Um, well, well, I'm going to uh, say, oh, go ahead, Miles. I just want to uh, uh, say we, you know, we've got some incredible stuff right now. So I definitely encourage people to check out the the website. We have a incredible investigation by Kim Kelly up into mm-hmm. black lung disease. If folks haven't uh, watched, read that, we also have an audio version uh, on there you can listen to. Um, and you know, we cover we just covered the Helen Gim race in Philadelphia. Although she didn't win, I think that that still had a lot of lessons for the left, very different from what happened in Chicago. 
but I think it's important for people on the progressive side of the side of things to really reflect on both wins and losses. And so definitely encourage uh, people to check that out. And, you know, what we provide, we do a monthly magazine um, and we also do regular web coverage of, um, of politics and especially the labor movement. And this is one of the most exciting times for the labor movement nationally. Um, you know, certainly in my lifetime, we have new leadership at the UAW, obviously mm -hmm. new uh, leadership at the Teamsters that are gearing up for a potential strike at UPS, which would be the largest private sector um, strike in uh, decades. So um, you, we're definitely going to be covering all that. We have pieces consistently on it and really incisive coverage of the labor movement. And Alex, of course, just recently took on uh, the role as the executive director. So I'll pass it on to him to uh, talk a little bit more broadly about IDP. Yeah, well, well, Miles made a, a, did, did a lot of that really well. I don't have that much to add. I will give a sneak preview um, to Gris, Griscom Stream Watchers. If you go to InTheseTimes.com, and if you subscribe to the magazine today, the first issue that you're going to receive um, is going to have an in-depth profile and a cover story on Brandon Johnson, um, where he came from, who he is, and how he won um, the mayor's race in Chicago. Um, so you heard it here first. That's an exclusive here on the Gris Griscom Thank stream. You very much. So if you go to InTheseTimes.com, and you will see all of that, the, the, you know, the, the great kind of in-depth reporting on issues like Black Lung that Kim Kelly wrote about, um, but a lot of other coverage on the labor movement, on social movements, um, on progressive politics and beyond. Yeah, folks, it really is an incredible resource. So if it's not on your radar already, you should definitely be uh, keeping up with it. Alex and Miles, uh, can't thank you all enough. Um, hopefully we can do this again in the next few months and celebrate some good, some more good news. Um, thanks so much again. All right. Thanks. Thank you. you. Take care, friends. Well, folks, you just heard from Alex and Miles. I mean, what, what happened in Chicago is very exciting. Um, we'll be trying to cover it as much as possible. We have a decent amount of listeners uh, up in, in Chicago, I know, who have always been wanting us to cover it more. So we'll definitely make an effort uh, to do more of that in the next uh, few uh, next few weeks. I don't know if anyone has any questions um, or anything like that you want me to get to uh, before I hop off. If somebody has something, I will get to it. If not... Um, this Sunday, uh, Matt and I are going to be doing a quick update show. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the things going on in the Texas Ledge. Um, next Tuesday, uh, we are going to be going doing a deep dive into the LaRouche movement, um, which is a very weird kind of old school lefty cult that has sort of had a resurgence in the past few years. If you missed it um, on Tuesday, we had Vivek Chibber on, which was really a lot of fun. Vivek Chibber um, is pretty full of life and is a really smart guy. Um, so we always like talking to him. We talked about what's going on with the post Bernie left. We talked about some of the misunderstandings that a lot of leftists have about imperialism. And then for patrons, we had our good friend Matt Huber on to talk about building a working class, um, a working class uh, climate change politics. So that was something that was really exciting. Um, I'm uh oh, congressional baseball fan says uh, any thoughts on Sugar Man Ron? I'm assuming that's Ron DeSantis apparently announcing soon. Uh, I mean, he's got to at this point. It'd be pretty embarrassing not for him, for him not to drop in. I haven't heard any whispers yet that he's going to be announcing. Uh, Youngkin, the the uh, governor of Virginia, put out a really weird ad today that wasn't really clear if it was implying his presidential ambitions or sort of su suiting himself up for a future governor run there. Um, it'll be interesting to see if this field ends up being a little bit more crowded than people thought. Um, and last one we got from Kowalski says, not a question, but the smog from the Canadian wildfires has reduced visibility in such a Nebraska to one mile. Um, that's, it's horrifying. I mean, I've only really seen those kind of intense wildfires in Portland, Oregon, and it's, I don't know, it's difficult stuff. Um, I hope that y'all are going to be okay, man. It's pretty devastating. Um, well, let's keep it positive. Uh, this news out of uh, Chicago is really, really exciting. Uh, despite all the money and all the attacks against Brandon Johnson, uh, that movement was successful. And I think uh, points uh, in a positive direction for building progressive and democratic socialist politics um, you know, across the U.S. So, folks, we'll be back this Sunday with a bonus episode. Matt and I, um, we got a lot of really fun things coming up in the next few weeks. I won't belabor you with them, but as I said, May is going to be a big month on Left Reckoning. So keep uh, tuned in Tuesdays at 6 Central. Come back for these Griscom streams and don't forget to subscribe at patreon.com slash Left Reckoning. Uh, take care, everybody, and see you soon.